All right, maybe we'll go ahead and get started with the introductions. Um, thanks everyone for making it to uh, this year's installment of Saturday Physics Talks. Um, it's been actually almost a year since we last were able to have one of these lectures, so it's really exciting to be back uh, this year, even uh, if it's just virtual. Um, we have two more talks coming up this spring uh, in, uh, in one month and two months. Um, we have a talk on medical physics from uh, Professor Moyed Mifton on March 13th, and then we have Professor Ana Maria Ray on um, Saturday, uh, April 17th. And again, you can find more information at our website, including um, the connection information um, Etc. And so, uh, hi to everyone on um, Zoom and on YouTube. And uh, I also really wanted to thank Veronica Lingo, um, who's arranged all of the um, uh, webcasting and uh, webinar connections um, for this talk. Um, and uh, we hope to see you at one of these uh, upcoming talks again um, <clears throat> later this spring. And maybe we'll get to see you in person again uh, starting in the fall. And we promise in person there are cookies. But, um, all right. So uh, today our speaker is uh, Professor uh, Scott Didums. Um, he got his bachelor's in physics from Bethel College and got his uh, PhD in physics from uh, the University of New Mexico. Um, he then was a postdoc um, in Boulder at uh, Jilla, and uh, he's currently a uh, fellow at the National Institute of Standard, uh, Standards and Technology in Boulder and uh, also has a, is a professor adjoint at the University of Colorado Boulder in two different departments, both the Department of Physics and also the Department of Electrical, Computer, and Energy Engineering. Um, he's uh, won uh, numerous awards for his research innovations, um, including uh, the I.I. Uh, Robbie Prize uh, from the American Physical Society. Um, he's also a fellow of the American Physical Society and a fellow of the uh, Optical Society of America. And his uh, research uh, focuses on uh, laser and optical frequency combs and uh, also ultra-fast lasers. And uh, this is uh, related to what he'll be talking about today. So uh, let's um, uh, welcome Professor Didums. And if you want to go ahead and uh, take it away, Scott. Uh, you're still muted, by the way. Great, yeah. Uh, thank you very much for the kind introduction. And yeah, let me add my thanks to Veronica for the excellent AV skills and getting this all organized. So I'm gonna try to answer in the next 45 minutes or so this question I pose there is, can you count to one quadrillion in a second? And you may notice that I used a little bit of a childish font on my title slide here. And that was intentional because Counting is probably one of the very first things you learned, or certainly one of the first things I learned. One, two, three, A, B, C. These are some of the very first words that children learn. And um, that's foundational, not only to your learning as a, as a human being, your growth, but counting and quantification of different aspects of the world around us are foundational to science. It's super important to be able to, to count and quantify the things around us, and that's uh, the, the framework on which science is built. So that's what I hope to relate to you, um, or a little bit of that story in, in this talk today. So I have to say that I was inspired uh, by Professor George Gamow, who was a professor here at the University of Colorado in the middle part of the last century. And he was a, a, a leader in his field in nuclear physics, in um, cosmology, the Big Bang, and the, the origin of uh, heavy elements in the periodic table. But he was also a very gifted communicator. And you can see that I, I was inspired uh, in my title by his book there, One, Two, Three, Infinity. And he was a very gifted communicator in popularizing science. And he wrote many books, and I, I would, could highly recommend this one, as well as the, as the others he, he wrote. Um, and you'd see if you read these books that he, he has a, a great way with words and also um, playing with numbers. He likes this, this game of playing with and understanding numbers. And so this limerick is on the front cover of this book or inside the cover. There, once, there was a young fellow from Trinity who took square root of infinity, but the number of digits gave him the fidgets. He dropped math and took up divinity. So sometimes numbers are so big that, um, we don't really know how to deal with them. And the number one quadrillion seems like a pretty big one. 
And so let's start to unwrap what that number is and, and what it means and what it means in the world around us. So I know there's, there's uh, probably a wide range of people watching the talk today, but I wanted to just provide a little bit of background because I'm going to throw around numbers a lot in this talk. And I just wanted to make sure people at least had a little introduction to how we refer to those numbers in science. And we use this uh, notation we call scientific notation to simplify numbers, particularly big numbers or very, very small numbers. It's much easier to write in this format where we would use an exponent to indicate the number of zeros that might follow a one. For example, in a thousand and a million, there would be six zeros getting bigger, you know, a billion, nine zeros behind the one, a trillion, and here we come to this number quadrillion, and 15 zeros, that's a pretty big number there. But of course, it's in terms of numbers, you could just keep going if you want. And, you know, your search engine that many of you use was inspired by this number, one or 10, one with 100 zeros behind it, Google. And, um, you know, that's still a far ways from infinity. So numbers are, 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 you know, can take a whole range of different sizes, but um, that's really just math. How does that relate to, you know, the world around us? So we see that if we look at our world population, you know, it might be at least of a few days ago, if I believe some internet counting clock, it was about 7.8 billion. And that's a pretty big number. Um, you know, you don't always need something big to run into a big number. A little drop of water, as seen here hanging on a leaf, there's about 10 to the 23 molecules of water inside that drop. You know, and if you look across our physical world, perhaps the, the biggest thing we know about physically is the universe. And scientists estimate that there might be something like 10 to the 80 atoms that make up the universe. So that's, that, that is a really big number. That's really hard to think about, you know, how big that number is. And that's part of the goal of my talk today is, is to try and help you understand, at least in a specific case, how we think about big numbers, the number quadrillion, and how we actually measure things um, with that magnitude. But before we get going, I thought it would be fun to maybe just have a little quiz. I'm hoping there's some students in the audience. Um, I'm really sad we couldn't meet in person, but um, I just thought I would offer a little quiz here to get you thinking about this number 10 to the 15 or one quadrillion. So in, if, you're, if you're participating in Zoom, I think um, we'll be able to pop up a little question there and you can reply, it's a quick poll. And so if you counted one number per second, how many years would it take until you reach one quadrillion or 10 to the 15? And I, I'm offering three possible answers, one, two, and three there. And there's a hint um, that you might want to use is that in a, in, a, in a year, there's about 32 million or 3.2 times 10 to the seven seconds. So I'll let you think about that a little bit. And if you want to play along and respond by taking the, the poll in um, Zoom, that would be great. We can just wait for a minute and see if we get some responses. Give it a couple more seconds here, maybe another 10 seconds. Might need to do a little math, or maybe you can just figure it out in your head. All right, why don't we go on ahead and close the poll? I think we might be able to show the results on the screen. Oh good, there were a lot of, a lot of people I see, 68% um, um, actually came up with the right answer. The, the, the right answer is um, the first one, 31 million. There were a few people who guessed at the others. So I'm, I'm happy to see there's, there's, of course, no winning or losing. There's no grade assigned here at the end of this talk. But, you know, the, the point of that was to just get your, your mind thinking a little bit about how these big numbers work and how we deal with them. And so the, the, the right answer would be obtained by taking the number of seconds in a year, about 32 million, and multiplying that by, um, or I'm sorry, dividing 10 to the 15 by that. And there, there you come up with about uh, 31 million years. So it's a product of 31 million and 32 million that gives you about one quadrillion. 
Okay, enough fun there. Let's let's start thinking about these numbers in a different way. You know, there's many different ways that big numbers show up. And, you know, it's it's maybe not just about the amount of stuff like I referred to in the first slide, the molecules of water or people on the earth. But big numbers also show up when we, we talk about counting things or referring to time. And it's remarkable as this graphic shows here that in our, you know, experience of what we can measure, there's about 36 orders of magnitude. So we, we make this logarithmic axis that goes all the way down from 10 to the minus 18, which are, represents some of the shortest events humans have ever generated and manipulated and recording, recorded. That's attosecond pulses. And it extends on the, on the far end all the way up to the age of the universe, which is about 13 billion years. And in between, there's all orders of magnitude of different experiences. Our, our, our human experience kind of lives in here between, say, a heartbeat and, you know, maybe 50 to 100 revolutions around the sun. Okay, but there's a whole lot of other stuff that exists even at shorter time scale. And there's, you know, a camera flash back in the uh, some century and a half ago was able to, to capture picture like that showing that a, when a horse is galloping, all four of its legs were actually off, the, off of the earth at the same time. The computers that we are using to watch this, you know, they're kind of ticking along at maybe the nanosecond time scale, that would be 10 to the minus nine. When we look at chemical reactions and the time scales on which the chemical processes that control life, in fact, happen. Much of that happens on the picosecond time scale or 10 to the minus 12, and then down to this 10 to the minus 18 number that I already mentioned. So extreme variation or extreme differences in time scales that we encounter in our, our natural world. And in fact, although we can't directly measure them, there's still shorter things happening on shorter time scales. The, the heaviest subatomic particle, the top quark, you know, has a lifetime inferred of about four times 10 to minus 25 seconds. I think that's a fraction of a yocto second. And then it, as, as scientists think about what was really happening at the very beginning of our universe, they, they bring up something that's called the Planck time. That's like the time it, light would take to traverse the tiny, tiny uh, singularity that was the beginning of the universe. And that's even 10 to minus 43 seconds. So there's enormous range of, of time scales that, that are covered in our physical world. But for, for this talk, I wanna focus on this one that I is about 10 to the minus 15 seconds. And that relates to the title, that's a quadrillionth of a second. And that turns out to be kind of the characteristic time scale of electrons motion in atoms. And sometimes we call that a Bohr orbital. You might have a simple picture of an atom with electrons going around it. And if you wanted to roughly think of the time it takes an electron to loop around the atom, that would be about a femtosecond or a part in 10 to the 15 of a second. Okay, so let's, let's delve in there a little bit and talk about what it would take to, to measure and understand things on that time scale. So if we were to zoom in or had, it, had a camera that could take a snapshot of a light wave, Okay, this would be light that is coming in your window right now or coming from the computer screen in front of you. If you could take an ultra fast snapshot of that, you would find that it might look like this. And in fact, we couldn't measure thing in inches there. We would have to change our time scale to femtoseconds where each femtosecond is a quadrillionth of a second. Okay, or using that scientific notation, now it's 10 to the minus 15 seconds. There's a bunch of zeros after the decimal point before the one. So I already mentioned this is this is really the time scale of interest for metrology on atomics at, at the atom level, the, the time scale of electrons moving and transitioning uh, around atoms. And it turns out it's also a key element of optical clocks. You saw in the in the title slide, or in the, the one slide, the announcement for upcoming talk of uh, Professor Anna Maria Ray, I did really encourage you to attend that. I think she'll tell you more about the atomic physics of optical clocks, but I wanna just delve into some of the pieces there because this relates to how we try to count those very short um, oscillations of light. And, but before, before I go on, there was one thing I, I meant to mention is that since we aren't in person, I, I, 
unfortunately can't take questions so easily. But if there were questions, I'd just stop here maybe for a second. And I see there might be some things in the chat. I think, um, let me just take a quick look. If not, I would come back. Okay, I don't see, uh, maybe I don't see a question yet in the chat. I just wanted to pause there for a second and, and give you the opportunity to ask questions. It's um, a little bit um, awkward because you can't just raise a hand so easily, but um, please do put questions in the chat and um, we can answer them as I go or at the very end of the talk, I'll make sure to answer them, hang around for 10 or 15 minutes. Okay, so back back to where, where I was talking about clocks. You know, every clock has a stable oscillator and it might not be that you're so familiar with, or, you know, in our, in our world, most of our clocks are either inside the computer or on your wrist. You don't have a, a, a swinging pendulum like the one I drew there, but a grandfather clock, for example, would have that. And the other main component of a clock is the counter. And here I show just a smiley face of a simple clock. And what you need to realize that that counter is really doing is it's measuring the oscillations, say of that swinging pendulum, and then accumulating them to keep time. So if one oscillation is a second, then 60 seconds are accumulated to give us one minute. That would move the minute hand. 60 minutes are accumulated to give one hour, that would move the hour hand on this clock. So with those basic ideas, we can then think a little bit more about other types of clocks. You know, I just told you about a pendulum clock and, and the resolution of that clock, you might say, is about one second. You can measure things uh, on the scale of the, the oscillating pendulum. The, the very best microwave clocks that, in fact, are used for telecommunications, the cell phone communications we use, the GPS systems, system that, that is in the uh, orbit above us. These uh, keep time with microwave frequencies, we would say, and so the, the oscillating object in those clocks is kind of at the nanosecond or even a little bit below. We'd say that's about 100 picoseconds is 10 to the minus 10 seconds. But these, these light waves I showed on the previous slide, they're, they're even five, time, five orders of magnitudes to 100,000 times faster than those clocks. So we really need some new tools if we're going to be able to count them and accumulate them in, in a manner analogous to what I show here for the, for the grandfather clock or the simple clock. So let's talk a little bit more about that. So we, we really need a way to count cycles of light, okay? And the problem is, is they're really, really fast. And there's nothing that we have, at least readily available, that could count those cycles of light. And a, kind of a useful analogy that, that might help you understand this is that um, if you were standing on the shore watching waves come in, you know, a wave might come in on, on the ocean about once per second, and you can count that, that would be pretty easy. But imagine if they were coming in 10 times or 100 or 1,000 times faster than that, at some point the, the cycles of the waves or this periodic oscillation just blur together. And so you can't resolve any longer the waves, it would be just so fast that you couldn't see anything. And that's a bit the situation with trying to count the cycles of light. So what we really need is something that, that looks and functions like a divider gear. And this is, you, you're probably familiar with this, you know, from a bicycle even, but it's mechanically, it's very easy to understand that we could have something, and, and this would be our fast oscillator here, for example, the light wave. And every time that goes, turns around, you might think of that as being one periodic oscillation of the light wave. And then there would be a big gear that would divide it down to a much lower frequency or a much lower rate. Okay, and this is very simple mechanical analogy. It's maybe dividing by about a factor of 10. And then this slows down the output is to, to a much more countable, and in the case of optics, we want to slow it down to a radio frequency rate, something on the rate of um, that conventional electronics, say the electronics inside your computer or phone might be able to deal with, okay? So of course it's, it's impossible to, 
to to even in this picture to capture the, the massive amount of division we need. We need in reality we need a dividing factor of about 10 to the 6 or about a million, okay? And that would be what it would take to divide down this optical cycles, a quadrillion cycles down to say 10 to the 9, which would be a number that would be manageable to count. Okay? So how how could we introduce or how could we implement such a clockwork to work with fields of light or light waves? So the, the next few slides, I'll try and explain that to you, okay? So here, here I've drawn again this wave of light that say was emitted from a laser. It looks like a perfect sine wave. And again, I remind you that the period of that light wave is about 10 to the minus 15 seconds or a femtosecond. So that again is much too fast for us to count. There's our eyes don't respond that fast. Even the fastest electronics can't respond that fast or keep track of those cycles of light. So we need something definitely different. Well, here's here's the trick. Here's the idea on how we're going to do that. Is in fact we're going to modulate. That is, we want to turn on and off. So this envelope here, this black line that my cursor is tracing across is a modulation and if we could turn on and off the light in such a way that exactly every 10 cycles of the original um, light wave were had passed by and then we had turn on the light again okay this would already give us some way of kind of accumulating 10 cycles and then we we click out we spit out one uh, tick if you would one pulse and that would give us a way already of dividing by a factor of 10, if you could see that. Now, in reality, we would need to accumulate something like a million oscillations, okay? And, and again, it's, it's very challenging to draw that, but um, you can see that you would have to have many, many of these underlying oscillations, 10 to the six, a million of them go by before you would get, if we could, modulate the light in that way, turn it off and on at that rate, then we would be at a much slower kind of time scale down to the nanosecond time scale. And that's, although that's very fast and short still, that's something that we can count. Um, I have, you know, those numbers are just really hard to think about maybe and hard to picture. So I, I actually have an example that maybe can explain that a little bit or help you understand what that modulation means. And it's very analogous to, to um, these tuning forks or these bars that you'll hear in just a second. It's the, the technique that a piano tuner uses to match the, the frequency or the tone of a key of your piano to the, the correct, in this case, this bar is able to A440, so that'd be 440 Hertz. So what you're going to see, and I'll play this a few times, is that these are these are uh, tuning bars like a xylophone, where it's going to get hit, and you're going to hear it ring, and you'll hear first one of them ring by itself, and then you'll hear the second one ring, and then they'll ring both together. And when they ring together, you should hear a modulation or a beat, which is a much lower frequency. Okay, so let's let's see if we can play this. So I, I think you should have heard the, the wow, wow, wow noise. That's, that's the beating or the modulation between the two tones that were different by one hertz. I, I, let me see if I can play it again here. I might have to back up. Yeah, just let you hear it once again. Okay, so that's something that your ear can hear, and I think you can understand the difference in the frequency or the, the number of sound waves actually coming towards you, coming out of your, your, your computer speakers. One of them is 440 hertz, the other one's 441 hertz, and those waves interfere in a way to create that beat frequency or that modulation at the difference, at the one hertz, and that was the wow, wow, wow noise you heard. So let's go back to my picture and see if that maybe helps you understand a little bit what's going on here. So that, that 
modulation is what you were hearing is a much lower frequency tone, okay? We're talking light waves again here now, so you don't see it, but it's, it's something that is a much lower frequency that you could detect, and that's analogous to that beating. So, so there's one thing that I need to tell you about light waves is we can look at them in as kind of oscillations. We can also look at their spectrum. And this spectrum, it's actually kind of interesting that um, those, those tuning bars that you just saw in the, in the acoustic example, the spectrum is, is very analogous to that. If we have just one color of light coming out of our laser, we represent the spectrum with just a single peak, just like one tuning bar, there would just be one of those, okay? Imagine the, the A440. But if our light is modulated like this, then the spectrum, it turns out, it consists of multiple peaks. And in the, in the acoustic example we just had, there were just two of them. But if you put multiple peaks spaced by the same difference, this would be, give a very strong emphasis to this beating uh, pattern. And again, this beating pattern here is the beating, the interference of electromagnetic waves, of light waves, but it occurs at a much lower frequency that you could detect compared to the very fast oscillating original wave. So this, this is the core idea that goes into creating an optical frequency divider. And in, as you might have noticed, that, that array of frequency modes is what we call them, the spectrum of the light, it looks a little bit like a cone, okay? And so I want to talk about this thing that is called an optical frequency cone. And this is a picture that uh, one of my colleagues at Harvard uh, made, and I kind of liked it because actually it has a lot of the right ingredients in there, okay? It, it, it plays on this analogy that this thing kind of looks like a hair comb, but and just like a hair comb, there's a bunch of different teeth, okay? And the, the, the key feature as it relates to the optical spectrum is that each tooth has a different color, okay? And the other key feature is that the teeth are perfectly evenly spaced. And that spacing is that modulation frequency. So we can make a little more of a scientific picture of this frequency comb. And it's an array of optical frequencies with uniform spacing. And in fact, each optical frequency, and you notice here on the bottom, I label this as frequency, and each of these lines represents an oscillator, and those, those are very fast oscillators, each going at about 10 to the 15 oscillations per second. That would be 10 to the 15 hertz, a quadrillion cycles a second. But the spacing between them is a much smaller number, and that spacing, as you see this simple equation, it's related the optical frequency is just a big number, okay, that's our divider number times this spacing. And that's really the key um, idea of a frequency comb and an optical divider and how we can use this tool to measure optical frequencies and to count optical cycles. I emphasize here that the, the kind of order of magnitude, the scale of these numbers, this integer is about a million and this spacing, this modulation frequency, if you would, those, that beating pattern is about 10 to the nine hertz. And again, 10 to the nine is, it's still a very big number, but it's something that our standard electronics can deal with and can handle. So if we can make such a frequency comb, we can actually um, count and accumulate these cycles of light. So the first frequency comb was made about 20 years ago. And in fact, it, it's a very simple idea you might see there, but it's a very impactful idea. And, and these two uh, gentlemen, Theodore Hench and John Hall, were awarded part of the Nobel Prize in 2005, in part for, for this discovery or this invention of the frequency comb. And, and John Hall, I should note, is, was also a professor. He's now Professor Emeritus. He's retired from the University of Colorado. So, so here I tried in this graphic to mix a little bit of this mechanical picture with the optical picture. And um, you, you already were familiar with the gear, okay? So, so we might have, in this case, low frequencies on this side. It's a bit reversed from how I drew it the first time. But we would have a low frequency, and here we would have either a multiplier gear. And the, the addition here is that we have lots of little wheels here, and each of these little wheels is associated with a light wave, okay? 
And so the interesting thing about this gear is that it can actually run both ways. So it can, can run where a little wheel is driving the whole clockwork and to give you out a much slower, lower frequency wave that you could detect, but it can also run in the opposite direction. So I want to emphasize, though, that what we're talking about, this optical frequency comb, is, is not at all a mechanical device, okay? So we use these mechanical pictures just to help us understand what's really going on there. But an optical frequency comb is really a special type of laser, and it's a laser in which all these different color modes, the different frequencies of light that were described by this simple equation I showed before, can all live and, and um, oscillate, we would say, together. But at the output, we, we can detect this much lower frequency, divided down optical frequency, if you will. And this kind of laser we call a mode-locked laser. So that's a, that's a type of laser that is now actually quite easy to make. So these optical frequency combs are, are easy to create and, and to use. So I think I'll just pause for a moment to see if there were any questions about what I talked about so far. I see. I see a question here. What technologies are being held back by our current limits on measuring small fractions of time? Well, that's that's actually a great question, and I think my next slides will address that a little bit. Um, you know that the technology or this measurement of small increments of time is something that um, has only been possible in the past couple decades. So before that, for example, we weren't able to make clocks that could operate at optical frequencies. And, and the very precise timing that we need for next generation clocks that will um, drive navigation and communication systems was in fact being held back by our ability to count these cycles of light. So I hope I'll give some specific examples in the next slides. And um, if, if I didn't answer your question, then let's come back at the end and we can bring it up again. That's a great question. Thank you. So let's see. Whoops, excuse me. So I also have a question in the Q&A about uh, a lot of what you said sounds similar to the um, fundamental frequency that generates standing waves. Um, are the two in any way analogous? Yeah, that's a thank you. That's a great question. Um, in fact, this this picture that I've drawn here, let me see if I can get my pointer back. Excuse me one minute. Um, this picture that I drew here, in fact, all of the different little colored waves there are standing waves inside this cavity. And this the, these objects at the end are mirrors, and they create, much like an acoustic instrument, um, they create boundaries that limit, you know, where, where the, the waves would be oscillating or not oscillating. We call those anti-nodes at the end. And between them, they're kind of like the plucked guitar strings or a piano string in your, in your um, piano at home. And they indeed form standing waves. So there's a very clean connection between these standing waves they add up to make short pulses, this modulation inside the cavity, and that lower frequency modulation is something we can detect. So yeah, thank you. That's a, that's a great question. So I wanted to, to in, the, in the next um, about 10, 15 minutes is the, the last part of my talk, just tell you a little bit how these tools are being used. And um, Clocks I, I had introduced as a as a topic that we um, that are important. Clocks are used, you know, in our global positioning system. They're used right now in making sure that my conversation gets tr transmitted to you in an orderly way. Everything is is recorded and turned into digital bits that are then turned into little pulses of light. And if the, the pulses of light are not timed precisely, it would come out at your end completely garbled. So Clocks play an incredibly important role in, in uh, technology and in science all around us. But a clock, it, um, what I wanted to tell you a little bit about in the next slides was maybe some scientific applications of clocks. And clocks, in fact, by themselves, one clock is, it turns out, is not so useful. It could be an interesting thing, but it's, you actually cannot 
measure a lot with just one clock by itself. And so networks of clocks or being able to compare, compare clocks one against the other lends a lot of power to doing different uh, physical measurements. And, and this graphic on the right is an attempt by an artist at, at JILA, the University of Colorado, to display clocks, three clocks that are in a network and using frequency combs to connect them between each other, these pulses, and um, to allow things like I listed here on, on the left, searches for dark matter. You know, I, I started out by saying that we think there might be 10 to the 80th atoms in our universe. But in fact, we also know that there's a lot of stuff that we don't know about, and that's called dark matter. Um, clocks allow us to test fundamental physics, the, the very inner tickings, that, that picture I offered earlier about how an electron orbits a, a nucleus. The physics of that is something that is, you know, still uh, holds secrets, holds interesting questions that people want to study and understand the very fundamental physics of what holds those atoms together. I'm going to show you an example of how clocks can be used to measure um, gravity, okay, and that turns out to be a very important application of clocks. And ultimately, these kind of optical clocks, the counting of, of the cycles of light, will be used to define a new definition of the second. You might know that the second currently is, is defined by a microwave transition and cesium clock. So in the future, I think we're going to have actually international timekeeping, if you will, will be at, at its base, have the counting of optical cycles. I see a few more questions, or at least I see the chat showing a few more questions. Maybe I'll just stop since it looked like there could be some coming in. They're mostly about uh, whether or not there'll be a recording. Um, oh, okay. All right. Um, However, there is a question. Um, are there animals that operate on these super fast time frames? <laughs> okay, that's a, that might be a question out beyond what I know. Um, most of biological happenings, I don't, I'm not aware that they, um, there's, there's biological functioning at the animal scale on these time frames. I would say that actually though, and it's a bit to my point about chemistry, is the very process that enables you to see is a chemical process in your eye, and that chemical process happens at the picosecond to femtosecond time scale. So there are chemical processes in animals or in us humans that operate on these time scales. But I think in, in terms of our functioning as a body or an animal's functioning as a body, I, I, I'm not aware of something at such a sh short or fast time scale. Let's see if I can. Seems like I can't get rid of the chat window. There we go. Let's go on to, to I, I, I wanted to show you, you know, a bird's eye view of what this optical clock network in Boulder actually looks like, is there's, there's um, three clocks, some on the university, one on the university of campus at Jilla. There, this building here, by the way, is the Gamow Tower, named after George Gamow. And then there's a couple other clocks down here at NIST, and they're joined either by optical fiber or even pulses of light um, uh, connecting buildings in free space. So this, this network, you know, one of, the, one of the issues that came up when we built this network is that the elevation of the laboratories over here at NIST are a little different than the elevations of the labs at Jilla, And that forced us to, to uh, encounter this problem or this question is that clocks at different elevations run at different rates or, or at least relative to each other a clock at a higher elevation would run faster. And so, for example, in this little cartoon here, if you took this clock and you raised it up just 33 centimeters against gravity, you would find that it would run about um, 1.5 nanoseconds per year faster. Okay, that's a pretty small number. If we talk about it in these fractional terms here, it's about five parts and 10 to the 17 faster. So that's... Um, Again, a very really small number, but actually those numbers are relevant, for example, in the global positioning system. You might know that the speed of light travels about a, a foot per nanosecond. And so if you had clocks 
that were different in elevation by, um, you know, 10 times this number, then, then you're off in location by 10 feet. And in fact, the, the global positioning system would not work at all if people, scientists didn't know about and understand and correct for these relativistic effects. So that's, that's something that, that shows up in these clock networks. And in fact, we can measure. And we can also, I mean, maybe more importantly than just testing what Einstein told us should be the case, is this type of measurement is very important for determining um, a, a surface of constant gravitational potential. And for uh, parts of our country near the coastlines, that turns out to be a tricky question in some cases because, uh, and it determines which direction water will flow. So 10 centimeters difference, which could be measured, I mean, this was an example of 30 centimeters, and you could see there's just enough resolution to see the small 30 centimeter step, but 10 centimeters of difference in height could determine whether you have a flood in some area or, or no flood. So these types of metrology tools could actually have a practical impact, in, uh, impact on, on measuring um, sea levels and the, the direction water would flow in very flat areas. I wanted to just click through quickly to show you these slides, the next ones that show kind of relativity in action. This is my colleague James Chow who provided these slides for me. And on this table in front of you is actually the aluminum ion optical clock that was used for those measurements I showed. It's part of our network. And you can see James here actually jacking up the table by about 30 centimeters. So that was in fact the measurement you saw before that he was able to measure when the clock was 30 centimeters lower, it was a little bit slower. So, so the stuff Einstein told us 100 years ago, here you can see it in action and in practice. So the, the last thing I wanted to tell you a little bit about as it relates to the measurement of light is on the topic of spectroscopy. And this is an old field. You know, some of you may know that it was Isaac Newton who used a piece of glass and was able to see that the white light coming from the sun or the apparent white light was actually a rainbow of colors. And this was the kind of experiment he did where he would send sunlight through a prism and you could see the different colors um, refracted at different angles due to the, to the glass of the prism. So, so that observation turns out to be very important because the different colors of light interact with materials like glass or the atmosphere or even the atmosphere of the sun itself, which act to, to tell us information about what those colors of light pass through. And when Newton did this experiment, he didn't have the resolution to see in the rainbow he created, but a uh, hundred years or so later, scientists were able to make elements that refracted the light more strongly so that they could see pictures like this. And this is actually the, the spectrum of our sun, and I call it the solar fingerprint. And that's because these dark lines you see, okay, you, you would see the rainbow, and, and when Newton took his images, it was all compacted too much so that you couldn't see the dark lines. But um, the dark lines are due to absorption by elements in the sun's atmosphere, and each dark line occurs at a wavelength specific to different elements. So if we can zoom in and look at the spectrum, the different colors of the, the sunlight very carefully, it actually tells us, you know, something about the sun. It also tells us about our own atmosphere that the light has passed through. And I want to give you an example of how we use these tools, the laser frequency comb, the, the precise knowledge it provides of the optical frequency to do um, fingerprinting. And I like this term fingerprinting. You kind of got an impression from that last slide that these, these characteristic pattern of dark lines is something that kind of looks like a unique fingerprint, okay? So, so all atoms and molecules behave in a similar way in that they absorb light at specific colors or frequencies. And, and these could be, you know, environmental in, in source. It could be related to basic science, chemistry and biology, or maybe hazardous materials. And if we can shine our laser light through it and then analyze that laser light, we can actually 
take a fingerprint of those molecules that are in the air before us. And, and here's how this works with that idea of the comb I showed you before. This would be this array of very precisely known frequencies. They would pass through some material, and that fingerprint of the material would get imprinted on the comb modes. So some of my colleagues put this to test in measuring greenhouse gases right here in Boulder. And, and actually, here's the, the image. You know, the previous slide was a cartoon. Here's the actual data. And each of those little fine lines is a tooth of the frequency comb. And this is carbon dioxide that's absorbing the, the, the light at these specific colors. And if you monitor or measure how much light, so it'd be how tall each one of these lines uh, stands up, you can make measurements of the concentration of CO2. And that's what's shown here in this plot. It's a little bit complicated, but if you track, say, where my pointer is showing, that green line there, that's showing the concentration of CO2 over the, over the air in Boulder over a few-day period back in 2013. And as you can see, it maybe you know this number 400 parts per million is kind of our global average of CO2, but it can vary pretty strongly. And so being able to make measurements like this helps one identify sources and sinks, you know, where the CO2 is coming from and where it might be going to. In another experiment, these same folks are using this technology to, to look for methane leaks. And this is in oil fields out in Eastern Colorado. So this can have uh, the, the ability to measure very precisely the frequency of light can have uh, real important impact. The last example I want to tell you about is one that I'm involved in, and um, that's in searching for exoplanets. And we can use this same precise measurement of the spectrum of starlight in this case to help us find a planet orbiting a distant star. So, so this animation shows you, and it's, it's not to scale, okay? It shows you a planet going around a star, and actually what happens is that planet tugs a little bit on the star as it goes around. They orbit the common center of mass. And so the star, if, we're, if you're staring at that star, you see times when the star is moving towards you and the times when it's moving away from you. And as it moves away from you, the spectrum shifts a little bit to the red. And as it moves towards you, it shifts a little bit to the blue. Okay, and so we can use a, a frequency comb to try and help measure those, those motions. And I said this isn't to scale, in fact, for an actual star and a planet like our sun going or our, our earth going around it, you would no way see the visible motion of these dark lines, the, the absorption features from the stellar atmosphere. You wouldn't see that at all. They would be just a tiny fraction of each dark line would be the motion. So we need a very precise tool, this frequency cone, to enable us to try and calibrate those motions. And these are what the actual spectra look like. And maybe you can see, particularly in this zoomed in version, is there's a bunch of little dots there along the bottom. And then in another row above it, you see this is the spectrum of a star, Barnard star. And in that star, there would be reason to bright light and then little dark bands. So these are exactly what I showed you in the solar fingerprint and what shows up in um, any star you would look at. And we measure the tiny little motion of those dark bands relative to the stable, precise frequency comb light. And it allows us to see very small oscillations, even at the meter per second level. So this is looking at a star many, many light years away, and we can see it moving towards us and away from us at the meter per second level. So that's, that's one of the powerful things one can do by being able to count cycles of light and control the light in a similar way. So I think I'm going to end there. Um, and just to summarize, maybe a few things you might want to take away from this is that you know big and small numbers or quantities are common in nature and we need tools to to help us measure them and that's really how we understand the physical world around us it's the framework on which our physical models and our ultimately our technologies that derive from those physical models and understanding of nature are built you know the specific topic and to answer the question at the very beginning is I hope I, I shared with you that there are techniques that allow us to actually count and track uh, a quadrillion optical cycles in one second. So that's the frequency of light, uh, uh, 10 to the 15 oscillations per second. We can, we can now count that 
and measure that very accurately and use that in measurements. And, and the key technology is one that Colorado and the University of Colorado and NIST should be very proud of because it was one that was invented here. This frequency comb technology came out of the laboratory of John Hall. And finally, that, that you know, I, I hope to give you a few examples in optical clocks, in uh, greenhouse gas spectroscopy, and in exoplanet discovery on how these tools are in fact used. So I think with that, I'll stop and I'd be happy to, to take any more questions. So thank you. I, oh, and one, one other thing I'll just advertise, remind you again, the um, upcoming talks. I'm certain both of these would be excellent. So I encourage you to attend. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. We we do have a couple of questions in the chat, and I also um, see one see one in the the Q and A. Do you want to try to answer some of the questions in the chat? Can you see them? Sure. Yeah. Let me see if I can bring the chat up. Okay. So let me get my pointer back normal. So in the chat it says there's. Let's see if I scroll up. Just make sure I get them. Um, clocks that are at different elevations run at different speeds if they are based on what types of time measurement? Well, I think that's the, the, I don't think it depends on the type of time measurement, meaning optical clocks or mechanical clocks, um, any kind of clock. And this was something that came out of the, the theories that Einstein introduced is that time and space are linked. And, and that is, in fact, it's that coupling of time and space that cause our perception or our measurement of time to be different in different uh, reason, regions of space. So it's, it's really, um, I think, any kind of clock this would show up in. So um, I see another question here. Why would you need to shine a laser comb to get the spectral fingerprint of using continuum light source? Okay, that's a good question. Yeah. So you're exactly right. You could uh, use a continuum light source. I think I didn't go into the details there, but but maybe in one of those pictures, you you got the the image of these very precisely known frequencies of the cone light, allowing you to measure um, the precise positions of these absorption lines. So that measurement is actually done in a readout that is uses another frequency cone to measure that, uh, those positions of the lines. And that's something that with conventional, like continuum light sources, you can't measure with such precision. Um, and that's because you would have to use like a grading spectrometer or something equivalent. And, and the frequency comb introduces new techniques to measure with precision down to kind of the cycle of light, literally a part in 10 to the 15 if you need it. So it, it introduces this very uh, amazing precision. The other point about it is that it's, uh, and I didn't really discuss that, is that lasers are very bright and they can propagate long distances. So if, if I wanted to make a measurement over tens of kilometers, you know, and I wanted to do that with just say a bright light bulb here, at, the, at 10 kilometers away, I'd need a really, really bright light bulb if I was going to detect any light at that end. So, so lasers and frequency combs are a type of laser. They also help in just getting the signal where we want it. Um, let's see. I see. Um, why do humans experience time as relative? Sometimes faster is slow. Clearly the technology is more regular and consistent. <laughs> yeah. I, I don't know that I'm qualified to, to chime in on why we experience time sl slow and fast. You know, there, there is of course this perception when something is boring, it's just creeping along, right? I hope, I hope my talk wasn't creeping along for you. Um, you know, the physics is pretty clear. We, we understand um, when things are faster or slower, but in terms of the human perception of fast or slow, I don't know that, I don't think I can, I can really address that. So, but it is a good question. Time, time is an interesting thing in, in multiple aspects. Um, let's see, I see another one here. How long before we see optical frequency combs on the market to possibly augment GPS? Oh, that's a great question. And in fact, you, you could, if you wanted to buy one, uh, get out your credit card, you could probably place an order today. There's a few companies here in the US, um, companies that spun off from the University of Colorado, companies in Europe. 
that sell these. And in fact, um, they, these same companies are involved in, in trying to mature the technology to the state that it could go on rockets and could ultimately fly in space. The example I showed of, of measuring in gas fields, that's a local company, um, Lightpath is named that company. And in fact, the, the technology is certainly robust enough to take out to an oil field and leave there and have it run autonomously for weeks, months, years. Um, to put something in space, there's, there's more kind of trials that one has to do, but that is definitely the, the direction that uh, people are interested in going. So that's a good question. Um, can you reflect on the current definition of the meter as the distance light travels in a second, presumably in vacuum? Yeah, that's, that's also a very important question um, and a really good observation is that um, if you can measure time well, you can also measure distance well. So the, the meter or, or the standard of length is defined as the distance that light travels in some fraction of a second, okay? It's in fact one over the speed of light, one divided by the speed of light. How far does, does um, light travel in that distance or electromagnetic radiation? And so, so time and length are directly linked by the speed of light. And in fact, in 1983, uh, you know, the speed of light was defined as a constant. And that means that if you can measure the frequency of an oscillator or the time between the cycles, then you can use the speed of light to convert that to a length measurement. And that is that is in fact exactly how um, length is determined. Now you mentioned there in, in parentheses, one caveat in vacuum, and that's true that, um, you know, we whenever you do these measurements in air, the index of refraction of the air or the medium that you're going through comes comes into that. And so if you'd want to do the most accurate measurement of length, yeah, you'd want to do that in vacuum. So um, good questions. Let's see another one. Uh, if we assume that time itself must be quantized as we cannot mathematically divide it infinitely, and light has a limit to how fast it can travel, would the implication be that a single period or some fraction of the period of a light wave be the smallest numerical unit of time? Oh, that's, a, that's an excellent question. So I guess that the big point in your question is that first phrase, if we assume that time itself must be quantized. And I, I think that as far as we know now, um, time isn't quantized, but I think if we assume that, then, then what you mentioned is exactly true. Um, our best clocks now allow us to split time, not into femtoseconds or part in 10 to the 15, but now we're we've just pushed through the attosecond barrier. So a part in 10 to the 18, a little bit better than that are the best clocks. And even at that level, we haven't seen a discreteness or a graininess to time. So um, if it's out there, people are still looking for it. So, so that's a really good question. I don't know if there are um, any more questions. Uh, those are some really great questions. I appreciate that. Yeah, I, I, one of the sad things about Zoom is there's not a good opportunity to kind of interact face to face. Um, hopefully in the future, we'd have that opportunity again soon. All right, that's all the questions I saw in the chat in the Q&A. So maybe um, uh, we should wrap up, but uh, thanks a lot, Scott, for a fantastic talk, and um, hope that some of you will join us next month where our talk will be on medical physics, which is a field where you're using physics to diagnose and treat medical conditions, so quite different. Um, but uh, we hope to see you then, uh, or to see you again uh, in April, and uh, yeah. All right.